Okay, well, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Christopher Rhodes. Dr. Rhodes is an associate professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He specializes in the evaluation and rehabilitation oriented treatment of dementia and neurodegenerative disorders, and is also the neuropsychologist for the UW Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Dr. Rhodes currently serves as co-director of Project ECHO Dementia and is a chair of the Health and Medical Subcommittee of the Dementia Action Collaborative, um, which is tasked with developing and implementing a state plan for Alzheimer's disease, as well as disseminating the standards for dementia-related healthcare in Washington state. He is also affiliated with UW's Harborview Memory and Brain Wellness Center, and we're just really pleased to have him back to come and talk with us about driving and dementia. Thanks for coming, Dr. Rhodes. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, I, just a, a note of appreciation for all of the attendees taking time out of your busy days and lives uh, to do yet another screen related activity. Um, I really have a, a lot of gratitude for that. Uh, and it is a pleasure to be part of such a wonderful program working to enhance uh, our geriatric capable workforce here in the region. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, one of the beautiful things about being a neuropsychologist. Um, the only thing I, I will say as I was thinking about this though is um, I, I come to you today really with the primary focus of a clinician and a clinician that has this conversation with patients and families on a regular basis. And my appreciation that this is one of the hardest, if not, I don't know, in some ways, the hardest conversation to have. Um, you know, disclosing a diagnosis is difficult. Talking about advanced care planning is difficult. Uh, managing comorbidities. And there, there are a lot of uh, hard things about this work. But driving is uh, right up there. And uh, it is not only um, difficult in the sense of it's not just about transportation. It's about independence and identity. Um, we forget sometimes that driving is a privilege. Uh, and we confuse it with the right. Um, but it's also, I mean, from a pragmatic standpoint, it is a necessity. Even if you live in an urban area, uh, being able to get to appointments or get groceries or having to be you know, transportation for somebody else who relies on you, there are some real practicalities. And my hope is to keep those things in mind as we talk about this difficult topic and to give you some pragmatic tools around how to communicate with your patients and families about your concerns about driving, uh, resources, and then steps you can take if ultimately you do need to report an unsafe driver. Uh, so lots of lots of things to talk about. I would love to get through this in um, you know, less than 75 minutes and spend a little bit more time in conversations. I'm always interested in what people are doing well and your expertise and things that have worked for you. Uh, but I do want to talk about um, the most prevalent cognitive risk factors, uh, which differ depending on the type of dementia or cognitive syndromes that we're talking about. I want to give you some information about screening and assessment measures that are useful in primary or specialty care settings, including the very busy ones in which you all likely work, and then of course resources. But I also want to frame this up uh, with a case study. This is a uh, one uh, that um, will resonate with many of you. This was a, a consult uh, to memory and brain, and then to me specifically as the neuropsychology component of that. A uh, 73 year old female with uh, memory loss and personality changes uh, and some IADL difficulties, including a recent motor vehicle accident. Um, and the question from her attending neurologist was, well, boy, you know, imaging looks pretty good for the most part. Uh, her neuro exam is non-focal. Uh, is this depression? Is this vascular cognitive impairment? Is this Alzheimer's disease or is it something else? Uh, rarely is the question, you know, to what degree are all three of these things happening and can you disentangle that? Uh, but very briefly, something to keep in mind as we go through this, this is an individual with a two-year history of gradual insidious onset difficulties with recall of names, typically people, acquaintances, not close family, but also having some trouble with spelling, uh, word finding difficulties, the tip of the tongue dysnomias, having trouble with both initially details of conversations and events, and then more recently, uh, entire conversations with no vague sense of re uh, recognition, but I, we never talked about that. Uh, no hallucinations, no fluctuations, uh, some increased irritability, low frustration tolerance, 
and uh, some disinhibition where she was uh, now physically aggressive. Um, no changes in her basic ADLs, so all of her bathing and eating and uh, toileting are all normal, although motivation to engage in such things is a little bit down. Uh, no neurological history, uh, does have a history of depression. She's on amitriptyline, fluoxetine, alprazolam, uh, PRN, doesn't take that very often. Lots of vitamins and supplements. Uh, she was evasive about her alcohol use and said she had two drinks a day. She either couldn't or wouldn't um, codify that into a serving, uh, which you have to disentangle. Uh, no marijuana, tobacco, um, very bright. She's a teacher, retired at this point, uh, no learning disabilities, ADHD. Uh, very active in her community. Uh, but there are some legal problems because of a questionable fault accident. And uh, as a neuropsychologist, my radar is always finely tuned for the backdoor medical legal evaluation. That was not the case here, uh, but they were battling it out with the insurance company. And uh, her personality changes more than her cognitive changes uh, led to some friction in her relationship. Uh, they're separated at this point, uh, going through marital therapy, had been separated previously 10 years, 15 years prior. Uh, two kids with marginal relationships historically, which are now poor and starting to have increased friction and difficulty with her family and friends. So you know, as we move through some of the different types of dementia or in the prior uh, wonderful seminars and lectures that you've um, engaged in here, you know, thinking about what might be in your differential here besides the things that were offered uh, by our uh, referring provider. So we'll, we'll come back to this after we talk about the, the matter at hand. One does not need to look very far to find plenty of news headlines addressing dementia and driving, and typically they're not good, they're not positive uh, indications of um, someone uh, coping well and uh, exercising excellent driving habits in the presence of dementia, um, fatalities, uh, individuals getting lost, uh, all sorts of uh, challenges. And, um, you know, as someone who has been subpoenaed by the um, state of Washington in a case where a woman killed her sister after being told not to drive because of her mid-stage Alzheimer's disease, uh, the consequences of this resonate. It's difficult. Uh, and it's difficult partially in that there's no crystal clear once someone has a diagnosis of dementia, they have to stop driving. Um, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, the vast majority of individuals with mild cognitive impairment and early stage dementia are excellent drivers, uh, partially because it is such a procedural memory heavy activity. And we have for many folks, they've been driving since they were teenagers or 20s. So you've got 40, 50, 60, maybe 70 years worth of driving history, a uh, complex overlearned task that we don't have to think too much about. Uh, and despite wayfinding difficulties, uh, it um, even with short-term memory loss, people can do quite well. Um, there are also uh, things like uh, independence and identity uh, that are wrapped up in driving. And uh, this is true across generations, although anecdotally, I would say you see it in some generations and some genders more than others. Um, and um, certainly individuals will wrestle with what they perceive as a need for driving versus what's really just a want. Of, this is an activity that I have always done. Um, it's part of how I relieve boredom or stress. You know, we hop in the car and go check out uh, a different town or a park. Uh, but boy, the public health concerns, uh, given the risks with this activity uh, and the ethical and legal dilemmas that pop up around advising someone around driving um, are numerous and thorny. Uh, we do know that driving skills are inversely correlated with dementia severity. So, uh, as dementia gets worse, driving abilities deteriorate, uh, but um, uh, the vast majority who would pass a driving evaluation early in the course of the disease, uh, that shifts in kind of the late mid stage uh, where uh, the vast majority will not now pass. So this is also not a one-time evaluation. It requires monitoring over time. And the question 
I think at the, the heart of this is how do we as clinicians working with our people with memory loss and their families balance autonomy and independence uh, with risk and safety? And for those of you who have looked into this or wrestled with it, there's not a ton of advice out there. Um, and the traditional measures uh, that we use to assess cognition or maybe driving ability are weakly at best correlated with crash risk or actual um, driving function, um, which can be supported by some more robust measures as well as maybe with cognitive testing. Uh, but there are other ways to assess driving ability as well, uh, each with its own costs, benefits, uh, risks, and nuances. As a little bit of background, just in terms of dementia and how this will interface with our driving skills. Uh, again, I know this is redundant with uh, prior uh, lectures, but um, I think some of it bears repeating. You know, we have a huge uh, segment of the population that is aging into the risk zone for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias uh, with our silver tsunami uh, and this huge baby boomer population. Uh, age remains the single greatest risk factor. Uh, here locally um, in Washington state, and I respect the fact that um, many of our attendees uh, may be within the Whammy region or Oregon, uh, but um, having been involved in our state plan and uh, the delivery of that and implementation of that plan, I'm going to focus on Washington, so forgive me for that, my Washington-centric um, presentation here. But we have 120,000 cases in Washington, and we're expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 by 2025. What is interesting to me about this is that number 120 has not changed much over the last couple of years, uh, but it still is increasing. Uh, it still is the third leading cause of death here in Washington. Uh, we have one of the higher mortality rates. Uh, for a long time, we had the third highest mortality rate. Uh, but as states began doing a better job of documenting Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death, uh, some public health accounting, uh, those numbers have changed a little bit and they continue to change um, as the Alzheimer's Association facts and figures come out. Be curious to see what they look like this year. And this is a set of stats that floors me the most that here in Washington alone, we have 350,000 plus unpaid caregivers. These are typically elderly spouses, adult children, could be neighbors, siblings, uh, grandchildren. Uh, these are folks with minimal training and um, typically uh, caregiving is a difficult task, so this adds uh, 250 million in healthcare costs for the caregiver's health, uh, and it would roughly equal or equal about a three, uh, 5.3 billion dollar industry if this was paid work. Uh, contrast that with the 132 geriatricians that we have, uh, which is a fraction of what we would need to serve even 10% of our population 65 and above, which is a number we would estimate who would have dementia uh, for that 65 and above group. So the question is on state by state levels and each state has its own state plan, You know, if 10% of this workforce, quote unquote workforce could no longer do their job, do we have the resources to step in and help compensate for that? And absolutely not, hence the need for a state plan. And that really becomes evident when you talk about things like driving and transportation. You know, how do we get the elderly individual in a rural part of our state to their medical appointments if they can't drive? County by county, the resources are very different. Spending a couple of moments on what's normal and what's not. Um, I think of it as, and the literature would support this idea that uh, variably after the age of about 20 or so, uh, aspects of our cognitive functioning uh, change, uh, not always for the better. Uh, vocabulary and a few other things do get better from 20 to 50. Uh, but typically things like processing speed, complex attention, short-term memory are things that are met with gradual declines around age 65 and then around age 85. Uh, typically not wildly progressive and typically not to the level that impedes instrumental activities of daily living or functional abilities. But contrast that with this large swath of our population for whom there is this abnormal process unfolding, uh, the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease, the Lewy bodies of uh, Lewy body dementia, where it's this gradual slow accumulation of neuropathology beginning likely in midlife 
and well before maybe two decades, 15 years before clinical symptoms are evident, that leads to a very different trajectory in cognitive functioning. And the question when we think about driving is on what point of this curve is someone no longer a candidate to drive? And if we think about the endpoint way down here on the right, um, out uh, in later age, it becomes crystal clear. Uh, if we think about this kind of period back here where you may have pathology, but no symptoms, you know, absolutely. There's you know, no threat to driving ability due to uh, pathology related cognitive impairment. It's grayer in MCI, but the vast majority of individuals will be likely safe to drive. Uh, and then what about this middle zone here? So early dementia versus mid, where is that cut point? And unfortunately, this is something that needs to be assessed on a case by case basis. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So few things change, uh, including procedural memory, which is one of the big uh, mediators of preserved driving ability where you, know, you can kind of be on quote unquote autopilot. That's a, that's a good example of procedural memory where you don't have to explicitly remember how to do something. Uh, but are things that are critical for driving, like selective attention, freedom from distractibility, how quickly we can process visual information, reaction time, um, all these things uh, are uh, part and parcel of uh, safe driving. MCI, as you well know, uh, is a precursor or prodrome uh, for often for uh, more significant cognitive impairment. Um, and when we think about subtypes, uh, in terms of driving, you know, less concerned about the amnestic subtype than perhaps uh, a non-amnestic multiple domain that involves executive functioning and visual spatial skills. So somebody who's having mild but notable difficulties uh, judging distances or perceiving objects and also has some problems with judgment or impulsivity, um, that's not a good recipe for driving uh, versus amnestic, which, you know, Maybe they rely on GPS or they have a navigator with them, um, but the, the risks would be very different there. Um, I won't spend too much time on this as we will go through some uh, things here, uh, but uh, again, this idea that MCI uh, often leads or is a precursor to more significant dementia, but not always, and hence the importance of a early and accurate workup uh, to rule out masquerading conditions, uh, maybe maximize behavioral and lifestyle interventions that may increase this 10% conversion rate or decrease that uh, and prolong function uh, and give us a better sense of what to expect in a year, two years, three years, uh, even though that uh, prognosticating is difficult sometimes. Uh, why this becomes important in driving is the earlier you can start having those conversations around planning for stopping driving, uh, even just introducing the topic and then maybe backing off it and not talking about it again for a while, uh, the better. Um, but uh, typically this is a long and evolving conversation. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because I, I think we're, we're all steeped in it at this point. Uh, you also likely are steeped in the fact that despite the hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of things that can cause dementia or conditions that look like dementia, you know, the four primaries that we tend to see are Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for either purely Alzheimer's or in combination with another etiology, two thirds, uh, maybe three quarters of all dementias, uh, vascular dementia, which is the next most common form of dementia, although Lewy body dementia is the next second most common form of a neurodegenerative dementia. Uh, and then FTD, uh, less frequent, but um, boy, a significant clinical and uh, family challenge. So I always include this even for folks who are going through you know, specialty training is that just that reminder and ways to talk with our patients around the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, and one of the analogies I usually use is like, oh, you know, it's kind of like cars you know, or transportation or automobile. So automobile is the umbrella term and Subaru is a very common form of a automobile here in the Western Washington region. You know, dementia is the umbrella term, Alzheimer's disease is kind of like the Subaru. I put this in here just for your reference. I suspect you've had it uh, covered in a variety of places, but um, I compiled this a while ago, which has different kinds of prevalence, some early symptoms, uh, what uh, architecture uh, in the 
brain, this likely corresponds to um, some nuances around course of you know, things you know, gradual and insidious uh, versus uh, fluctuating or rapidly declining. And then what we're learning around the underlying etiology. So really um, here for your reference. But as we think about these early symptoms, you can already get a sense of how each may differentially affect or uh, risk or increase risk for uh, driving problems. So in Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, one of the common things you hear early on is getting lost in familiar environments or you know, my mental map of the world, this isn't the same and, and I, I miss turns and I get really stressed out on the freeway uh, versus in vascular dementia where you know, reaction time uh, versus uh, DLB uh, with visuospatial difficulties or FTD where in the behavioral variants um, you may have impulsivity, uh, anger, um, maybe less concern in the language variants. Also just a reminder here that this is a long-term process for many folks uh, with Alzheimer's disease and potentially a 30 to 40 to 50 year disease when you think about a pre-symptomatic phase of five to 20 years, uh, MCI phase of one to 10 years, and then uh, frank dementia lasting anywhere from two to 20 years, uh, depending on comorbidities, depending on age of diagnosis, stage of diagnosis. Um, so as we think about where in this trajectory to have the conversation about driving, if you know you're on it and you know you're headed to the place where you will need to retire from driving, uh, the sooner the better. The other thing I will add is that um, often, you know, there's a question of why diagnose dementia, let alone the variants. And, you know, we know with Alzheimer's disease, there is a language variant, uh, there's a spatial or a visual variant, there's an executive variant and uh, more amnestic. Um, so one of our main interests here at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is the topographical heterogeneity of pathology and how that gives rise to different clinical syndromes and resilience and things that you may be able to train up or um, recruit spared strengths. Uh, and why for me this becomes more than just an academic question is of these two individuals, who are you going to have more concerns about driving? The person who's got word finding problems and tip of the tongue you know, word retrieval issues or the person who can't make sense of their visual world? Um, it's going to be the second. With individuals with vascular cognitive impairment, um, and this is beyond the scope of this talk, but for the more frequent, you know, less, less, more the, less the um, uh, multi-infarct dementia, but more the kind of chronic microvascular ischemic change, which can look a lot like Alzheimer's disease in the sense that it's slow in its onset and mildly progressive, uh, unlike a focal stroke. Uh, the things that affect driving ability are slowed processing speed, uh, weakness in limbs, so difficulty uh, with reaction time, and then being able to get the foot from the gas to the brake. Um, uh, individuals who have trouble with range of motion, sometimes post-stroke, um, and this fluctuating attention and concentration. When we think about DLB, uh, the hallmarks there are, you know, subtle memory impairment early on, uh, which becomes much more evident as the disease progresses, but early difficulties with attention, concentration, visuospatial skills, and executive functioning. Um, so again, that making sense of your visual environment, attending appropriately, and choosing the right reaction. Um, on top of that, uh, there are prominent fluctuations usually. So an individual who may be okay to drive on one day when they are closer to their baseline uh, certainly may not on another day or a different part of the day uh, where uh, symptoms are exacerbated. Um, I have yet to see anything in the literature or a encounter anybody with DLB who has had problems with driving because of hallucinations. These, these aren't like um, I saw somebody in the street or a dog and I slammed on the brakes and somebody hit me. I, this I have not seen or heard of. So if anybody has, I would, I would love to hear about it. 
Uh, with Parkinson's, uh, which you know, most people know a lot about the motor syndrome that accompanies Parkinson's, but this uh, is indeed a neuropsychiatric uh, condition as well. Uh, there tends to be a combination of uh, visuospatial difficulty uh, with difficulties around visual analysis, uh, synthesis, and discrimination, uh, as well as um, executive problems, um, which uh, can manifest in driving fairly early, even if someone does not have uh, PDD or Parkinson's dementia, uh, even in uh, MCI and Parkinson's, uh, there can be some difficulties with driving. Uh, and highly uh, interrelated with medication on and off uh, periods. Uh, so certainly worth uh, evaluating the cognitive piece as well as the motor piece uh, and medication response. In FTD, uh, which marked typically in the behavioral variant uh, with less memory difficulty, but more uh, executive or interpersonal difficulties. These are individuals who are typically in their late 40s or early 50s and are doing a lot of driving. Uh, it tends to progress more quickly, which shortens that time frame that you have to have these conversations about retiring from driving. Uh, and um, there's some nice data, it's a little on the old side now, that uh, looked at uh, significantly higher uh, things that you would associate with um, disinhibition, impulsivity, things like speeding tickets, blowing through stop signs, uh, higher average speed and a higher number of uh, accidents. It actually looks uh, pretty close. Uh, they haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison, but it looks pretty close to what you see in uh, driving in uh, ADHD teenagers and uh, people in their early 20s, um, but for a different reason. So some nuances, depending on the type of dementia that we're thinking about, both in terms of the presenting symptoms, the course, the timeline, um, but when you look at uh, driving with dementia overall, uh, we know that uh, around age 80, there is a uh, huge increase in crashes, uh, still not as high as teenagers, uh, but it's really it begins at 74 and there's almost this logarithmic increase as uh, age increases. And uh, what outstrips that and is certainly much higher um, than teenagers or younger adults are fatality rates, uh, which makes sense given uh, physical robustness and medical comorbidities. Um, for our older adult population, 65 and above, motor vehicle accidents are about a quarter of all accidental deaths um, in combination falls, uh, many other things that you probably see clinically. So while uh, there are certainly risks to the population, uh, the risk to the individual uh, is perhaps uh, greater than that. Uh, some stats that are about five years old now would say that there are about a million and a half older adults with dementia who are driving uh, and that we don't have a gold standard. This is, this, there's no hemoglobin A1C for driving um, and road testing is, both not cost effective, but also uh, does not have the highest uh, validity that one would want in assessing driving ability. Uh, the other thing in reviewing all of these and reviewing a review is that, um, boy, they do these studies very differently. Uh, some are done with uh, retrospective um, kind of analyses of you know, going back through your driving history as you recall it or uh, collateral recalls it. Some are done with actual on the road evaluation. Some are done in a simulator uh, and each of these are very different. So doing comparisons, head to head comparisons across studies is, is challenging. Um, it's hard to do a randomized control trial of this. Uh, Office-based tests, they hang in there fairly well uh, with driving test failure. Um, and the on-the-road kind of DMV test and a driving simulator um, aren't that far apart at this point. Uh, they have gotten significantly better. Uh, uh, there's no clear cutoff. Uh, and typically the way I think of it is, you know, the things that you would do in the office, including a neuropsych eval, are kind of a, a trigger or a um, indicator for who should go on for a driving evaluation, uh, but aren't driving evaluations in and of themselves. I will say that there are some providers who are deeply comfortable with saying, nope, time to hang up the keys. Uh, and there are as many, maybe more, who are very reluctant uh, to make that determination without 
the opinion of an expert who has done a you know, world-class evaluation given the stakes for this. Uh, when you look at primary care providers and their feelings about this, um, it's a bag, mixed bag. Um, and some of it is, um, I have no idea what the requirements are in my state, um, I, let alone if I've got somebody who lives you know, in Washington part of the year, then California part of the year. Um, if I call the DMV and say this person can't drive anymore, uh, I have no idea what to connect them with in terms of how to get around. I'm worried about uh, what it will mean for my relationship with this person that I have taken care of for 15 years. Um, I you know, raised it once and they said they were never going to come back and see me. Um, I don't know how to really assess the cognitive domains that we know are important in driving abilities. Uh, and primary care providers also think uh, very highly of the work that specialists do in this area. And primarily it's occupational therapists, but also our colleagues in geriatrics and in the memory disorders realm. Um, so um, frontline provider and primary care certainly needs the participation and support of the team here. If we get into those specialist kind of realms, uh, if we look at the American Academy of Neurology practice parameters, which has not yet been updated, um, or at least not that I could find, uh, level A uh, would be don't listen to the patient, uh, unfortunately, uh, and a CDR of one, uh, maybe 0.5. So 0.5 corresponds to MCI, uh, CDR of one is early stage dementia. Um, however, I mean, if you look at this, uh, half to maybe 85% are found to be safe after going through a driving evaluation. So you can't rely on that as a cut point um, per the previous slides. The next tier of evidence is um, a caregiver rating as marginal or unsafe is actually fairly um, robust. Uh, however, you still have to factor in uh, the relationship between these individuals, how often they drive with the individual, uh, whether they have cognitive impairment, uh, and then some of the other issues of if this person no longer drives, what does that mean? Level C, uh, mini mental of less than 25, um, there's some evidence for that. A history of traffic citations and crashes, of course, um, and changes in driving habits. And that's always an interesting question and a nice way to open this topic up is to ask about changes in driving habits, not driving abilities, but your habits. Um, so people who are driving less or aren't driving in high demand situations, um, and not because of glaucoma or cataracts or other vision problems, but, well, you know, it's, it's awful hard to pay attention to all the bikes and the pedestrians in downtown Seattle or Bellevue, and I just, I don't drive there anymore. Maybe that's good judgment, but maybe it indicates something else. Uh, and then certainly aggressiveness or impulsivity. You can imagine that probably manifests on the road too. Uh, there is a complex algorithm that I will uh, include here just for your own um, kind of use if you're interested. Uh, but what's nice is it does take into consideration other mediating variables like alcohol, medications, uh, whether or not somebody has sleep apnea or uh, something that's going to increase fatigue, particularly behind the wheel, motor impairment. Um, so there's this kind of uh, rubric you can use to assess risk. The unknown or unclear or uncertain things are whether neuropsych evals really do anything or if it's helpful to send somebody to um, rehabilitation or um, other interventional strategies. Uh, so there are some folks that offer driver rehab, uh, some OT or um, SLP folks uh, that will train up driving abilities uh, after an assessment. And it's, it's not that there's evidence that that doesn't do anything, it's just it's not clear. Uh, the CFP came out with those, our Canadian colleagues, uh, counterparts, uh, came out with a nice practice parameter um, of uh, kind of a checklist of if your patient has a history of driving accidents, um, you can do an office-based little mini neuropsych measure uh, to look at uh, visual spatial attention, visual motor processing speed, and executive functioning, uh, clock drawing tests. So there's some measures here. Um, whether or not you factor in a neuropsych eval under cognitive test scores. Uh, and the thing I liked about this is the importance of asking the patient and family member separately, which is really hard to do sometimes in terms of time limits or 
um, comfort. Sometimes uh, patients will say, I don't want you to talk to my wife separately. I want to be in the room for whatever you talk about. Um, there are ways people can get you information, of course, uh, but that um, it, it's you want to do better than just kind of looking out of the corner of your eye to see the nonverbals from the spouse as the patient says, oh, no, I don't have any problems with driving and the spouse is like, you have to find a better way to elicit more information around what are the problems, how often does it happen. Which gets us into the territory of um, obtaining a driving history. And I would offer you that, you know, one of the benefits of what we do as neuropsychologists is we get a lot of time with patients. Um, you know, typically a clinical interview for me is an hour and then we do three hours or so of testing depending on the presenting problem. So I have time to dive into these things. And I, I fully respect that the busy clinician in a primary care setting or a specialty care setting, um, this may take an entire visit, right? So you may have to create a visit for this. But I would also offer you that community mobility and you know the stakes are important enough that it, it's worth doing. Um, but that's easy for me to say as a neuropsychologist. So the things that I ask about, I'll, I'll maybe I'll run through it that way and you can take the things that you like or seem germane for your practice. Um, I usually ask about past and current driving history um, and uh, usually open the door with, you know, oh, we, we talked a little bit about medication management systems. We've talked about ways to keep track of your finances. How are you doing with driving? Any changes in your driving habits? And then that kind of opens this topic because uh, it's in the realm of instrumental activities of daily living. So you want to know, you know, how many miles and in what environments, um, you know, any tickets or accidents. Um, and there's a difference between those where, you know, I was, you know, I was stopped at a stoplight and somebody rear-ended me versus the roles were reversed there. Um, has anybody voiced any concerns about your safety? Um, are the kids reluctant to have you drive the grandkids to soccer practice? Um, whether that's right or wrong, you know, has anybody you know voiced anything like that? Um, any changes in habits? Uh, you know, are you avoiding things like driving at night on the rain or on the freeway in the rain? Uh, which you know maybe that, again that maybe that's good exercise and judgment, but uh, is it causing any functional interference because you're not driving in certain places? Uh, speeding. Uh, one of my favorite questions is, you know, okay, well, say you knew all the police were occupied and you weren't going to get caught. How fast would you go? You know, speed limit's 45. How fast would you go? Uh, and, you know, that answer might be different uh, in the freeway uh, versus in the city. Um, red lights, you know, any red light uh, violations. Um, say you're you're on I-5 and uh, traffic's moving at 75 miles an hour, pretty pretty heavy flow. How far away are you between you know you and the next car? Um, say you were at you know a dinner and you had a couple of glasses of wine. How long before you'd hop in the car and drive home? What do you think? You know, right away, a couple hours. You know. uh, tell me what medications you're on and you know any, what have you heard about how those might impact your driving ability. Um, Oh, the, yeah, the um, kind of the road rage, you know, frustration tolerance while driving. Um, you can give people a certain amount of a pass due to just COVID fatigue, maybe and stress right now, but um, both the, um, you know, how often have you received or given the one finger salute uh, in situations? Uh, and then another favorite to ask about is um, scrapes, dents, mystery marks on the car uh, and the wheels, the wheel well. So sometimes people with visual spatial problems will be hitting curbs or having trouble with three point turns. Um, garages are always a, a good indicator of, of that. Uh, do you use GPS? Uh, do you use any navigation systems? Um, say all of a sudden you decided you wanted to use one, you know, what would that be like? Um, um, is there anybody who won't ride in the car with you? Kind of as we talked about a little bit. And then, yeah, what are your, why do you need to drive? You know, I, I get why you want to drive and why you have driven, but what's, uh, what's utterly necessary? So, then to get the same information from a collateral. Uh, but uh, it, it's also, I, I learned this a while ago that I would ask all these questions and it would all sound good. Then I thought, well, wait a minute, when's the last time you actually rode in the car with this person? Oh my gosh, it's been two years. He always drives. You know, if we go anywhere, he's always driving. So it's been, it's been a long time. Ooh, okay, that's different, right? Uh, and, you know, 
when did you drive with this person? Was it a, you guys were going on a road trip or it was a stressful, you had to get somewhere? Um, the other thing that I think this provides is an opportunity to start talking about this. Yeah, so it's the beginning of the conversation. Um, you, not right out of the gate, at least I wouldn't bring up um, liability and, you know, oh my gosh, well, you have this diagnosis and these medications that are in your medical record. And uh, if you were to get into an accident and the attorney requested or your whoever requested your records, you know, you're going to be liable for this. That doesn't go over real well, um, even though it may be true. Um, and I really, uh, I think language is important. And the idea of retirement from driving, uh, people have different phrases they like, but that's the one I like that, you know, just like we retire from work or many, most of us do, um, uh, at some point we will all retire from driving. And that's always an interesting question too, you know, what would it take, you know, what would have to happen for you to retire from driving? And hopefully the answer isn't, you know, like a severe accident or something like that. Um, if we think about the things that you could do uh, in your office to assess cognition, uh, I, like many, would advocate use of the MOCA. Uh, as you can see here, sensitivity and specificity uh, in frank dementia uh, is suboptimal uh, for the mini mental. Uh, it's adequate to suboptimal for uh, the mini cog. It's uh, lower when we think about MCI, uh, and the MOCA does a lovely job of detecting. Uh, MCI and dementia. Uh, if anything, in certain populations, it's overly sensitive. Uh, and you have to be careful with that for um, different cultures. Just because it's translated doesn't mean it's validated in that culture or language. When we look specifically around driving, uh, you see here that uh, these aren't huge sample sizes, although the 2015 um, ESSER study has 243. Uh, there are some cutoffs, since this is partly where that uh, AAN practice parameter comes from. Uh, for individuals, and this is for standardized road tests, for individuals with less than a, a, a mini mental of less than 20, so 19 and below, uh, everybody failed the road test. So if your mini mental is a 17, highly unlikely that you're going to pass it on the road test, so maybe you don't get sent for one. Uh, if it's above 24, still a third failed. And I think therein lies the mini mental, not the most sensitive instrument. But if we look at the MOCA, if you've got a 27 or above or above a 27 on the MOCA, you are highly likely to pass. If your MOCA is less than 12, uh, you are highly likely to fail. If you're a 13 to 27 or 12 to 27, it's 50-50. And it doesn't necessarily correlate linearly with what that score is. So it depends on domain, it depends on uh, degree of impairment. Um, so lots of factors here. Uh, but, you know, a MOCA of less than 18 starts to become concerning, uh, and especially as that number keeps going down. So a one point decrease, uh, you're 1.36 times as likely to fail the on the road test. So some, some more information than we've had in the past, but still not a ton which leads to more detailed neuropsych evals. And um, I, um, the longer I do this, the more I think fewer and fewer people actually need a neuropsych eval. Uh, but I, I think when it's helpful are the folks who do well on screening, but you know there is something amiss. So being able to detect mild and early impairments. Um, I think we add value when it's a question of uh, differential diagnosis, uh, when it's around decision-making capacity, less so driving capacity, but uh, as you'll see here in a second, I think we can be helpful there. Uh, you have questions around other you know, capacities like medication management or financial management. Uh, sometimes you don't need a whole neuropsych eval for that, uh, but it, having objective cognitive data is something I think that we do add to capacity evaluations. Uh, treatment planning, measuring response, uh, setting the stage for rehabilitation. So to be able to delineate which domains are mildly impaired and how they may respond to some dedicated work, uh, either restitution or compensatory. And then, you know, how do folks adjust to this? Um, you know, the, uh, the psychologist part of me is always looking at um, how do we help folks cope with uh, the changes that they're going through because of acquired cognitive change. 
When is it not so helpful? Um, my personal cutoff, unless it's language-based, is a mocha of less than about 14. Uh, it's a torturous process and you usually don't get much above the floor of measurement. Uh, again, unless it's language that's really driving that. Um, you get as much out of a brief evaluation or a screening often. Um, uh, the unwilling, uncooperative patient. So unlike an MRI or a blood draw, everything we do is contingent on effort. Um, reminds me of my favorite neuropsychologist joke of how many neuropsychologists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is only one, but that light bulb really has to want to change. Um, active substance abuse, severe anxiety, active psychosis. I put the asterisks here in that um, unless you're looking for a snapshot of here's how this person is functioning while they're using these particular substances or while depression is at this level. I mean, what you're gonna get back is, um, boy, this person's really depressed and anxious. Let's work on that and see what improves. And then maybe we can shed some light on what else might be underlying this. Uh, and then we're always mindful of practice effects. Uh, so you, you wanna be careful about readministering things uh, which includes the, the MOCA to a degree, uh, because an improvement in performance may not be an improvement in function or condition. It may just be familiarity with the measure or regression to the mean if somebody was really impaired to begin with. Um, what's most helpful in what we do? Uh, so the trail making test uh, is, a, again, a measure of visual spatial um, attention and uh, mental flexibility. Uh, it is the thing that we do that correlates most highly with crash risk in older adults and driving ability. And it's a nice, um, there are two different conditions. One's just a simple connect the dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fast as you can. Uh, the next is alternating between a number and a letter. So a more extensive version of what you have in the mocha up in the upper left-hand corner there. And if you think of A as kind of your control of, you know, what, uh, how long does it take somebody to do this? What's their processing speed like in their visual attention? When you subtract A from B, you get a better measure of cognitive flexibility and flexible thinking, more of an executive measure, uh, independent of a motor problem, perhaps. Uh, clock drawing, which measures uh, visual spatial skills and executive functioning, block design, and other visual construction and visual problem solving, uh, ray complex figure, line orientation. So all these things here in the middle are really visual spatial and more kind of dorsal stream of where things are in space versus ventral stream, which is more what things are. Um, although that's important also in driving. So here's an example of uh, trails B um, at uh, baseline when an individual's MCI here on the left a year later, and then a year and a half after that and the time on this uh, deteriorated significantly such that at five minutes, this was discontinued with five errors. And in most driving evaluation, the cutoff for trails B is 180 seconds with no mistakes. Uh, here's a, cop or a version of the Ray complex figure. This is the same individual at MCI and you can get a sense of uh, visual spatial function as somebody sees this object. So the task is just to copy this right below it. So you're not showing it to somebody then taking it away. Um, although there are some memory components to it after you do the copy. Uh, and then here is the individual a year later than a year and a half after that. Uh, and kind of like the clock drawing test, there are two things here, right? There's the visual spatial component where the figure is distorted, you know, as the parietal lobes are changing. Uh, but it's also drifting up into this other figure and kind of becoming more stimulus bound, uh, which is more of an executive deficit. And if we had the colored pen approach on this, you would have seen that the individual started with the cross on the left and then kind of added pieces. Um, and typically people with intact frontal lobes will draw the big rectangle first and then start adding other bigger parts and then do the details later. So there's a kind of a way you go about this as well as the, the spatial part. So it's a, it's a nice measure on a couple of realms. Um, here is a, in, in one week, um, so this on the left was Monday's patient, um, on the right was Tuesday's patient, and they both have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if we were live in person, I would ask you what kind of Alzheimer's disease did they have? And if you said on the left, this is somebody with PCA or posterior cortical atrophy, you would be correct. Uh, and if you said on the right, this is somebody with logopenic primary progressive aphasia, you would be correct. 
Um, so these are in roughly equivalent MOCA scores, uh, although different domains affected. Uh, again, that's what the figure is supposed to look like. And then on Thursday, uh, here is another uh, version of that same test with a whole different etiology. Um, if you are thinking along the lines of, oh boy, there's some weird kind of perseveration here and it's disorganized and fragmented and don't know what happened over here and that boy, that, that it wasn't real well planned. Uh, this is somebody who didn't really use the page that well then had to cram this in over here. Um, you would be thinking FTD, you'd be correct. So uh, again, just in one test, uh, there are things and there are patterns within the test that are what we are looking for to help shed some light on what's going on. And um, I also find this helpful to show to folks sometimes when you have the driving conversation around or clock drawing of or pentagons or whatever the cube of, you know, this, this is how your loved one is seeing the world. Um, and, you know, what does that mean in terms of driving or other activities? So you can, you can use these for other reasons too. However, I will be crystal clear um, that, you know, neuropsychology is a part of the process. It is a uh, piece of the diagnostic process and um, it's not a driving evaluation. I would rarely would I feel comfortable saying based on how you did with cognitive testing and everything we know about you so far, you should retire from driving right now. That's, that's pretty rare. My, my cut point for that's pretty high. Um, what I will say is, you know, ideally you would do an evaluation with a specialist, somebody who knows what they're doing and can evaluate actual driving skills and abilities. Uh, based on your performance, you are unlikely to pass that. And it's going to be a really expensive thing that's going to take time. And it's going to be stressful. If you want to go through that, I, I think you're going to hear the same thing, but I understand the desire to go through it. Um, similarly, boy, you know, you did amazingly well on all these measures. And I'd be surprised if you went through a driving evaluation and didn't pass, but I don't know that. So to have that conversation. And then here are your options. So one would be a, a private non-clinical assessment. And typically companies do this to look at um, you know, ways to enhance usability uh, or user uh, interface with the vehicle. So it might be um, other kinds of controls or um, you know, it might do some in-car training um, around how to improve the driving environment. Um, they may then recommend, oh, you know, if we maximize your vehicle and, you know, dial everything in, still a little concerned and you probably need to be seen by a occupational therapy driving rehabilitation specialist. Uh, and they don't typically offer any kind of additional driving related rehab or training. Uh, these in our neck of the woods are the cheapest option, um, $100 to $200, uh, but certainly some limits. If you then move into the OT uh, driving rehabilitation specialist, uh, the benefit here is that they do a comprehensive medical history. Uh, they do a physical assessment, so timed up and go. They do a reaction time uh, from you know, your foot from the gas pedal to the brake. Uh, they look at useful field of view. Uh, they do a very, very tight battery of the cognitive measures that have the most predictive validity for driving. Um, so not great in terms of differential diagnosis, but great in terms of how these cognitive functions are important for driving. Uh, they do often do a functional or on the road the assess on the road assessment, and uh, the people that I like the most are the ones that will go to the patient and family and drive with them in their vehicle in their environment uh, versus. Uh, come to a clinic and get in a foreign vehicle and drive in an artificial environment, although there's some benefits to that too. And they typically have um, a non-dichotomous outcome of, you know, if you, if you think about like a DMV evaluation, you either passed or you failed. And the thing with the DMV evaluation, at least here in Washington, is that you can take it as many times as you like. Uh, I think the record for um, someone I have worked with has been seven times before they finally passed. Um, but with this, the recommendations are often, boy, you know, in these scenarios, in these settings, your driving abilities seem to be good. So under 35 miles an hour, residential area, well-known, well-traveled routes with use of GPS, no radio, no food, no conversations, uh, your sole task is driving, let's reassess in six months. 
Um, so there's some recommendations. And you know, you could work on these different rehabilitation oriented activities. Uh, the problem is they are a little bit, well, fairly uh, moderately more expensive. Insurance typically does not cover them. Uh, and um, rehabilitation is both costly and questionable in terms of outcome of does it actually really do anything. Uh, one of the things that has been investigated is this uh, driving like task uh, neuro racer. And uh, when the paper came out in 2013 in Nature, pardon me, one of the things that uh, got a lot of attention was, oh, you know, older adults need to use both sides of their brain to do the thing that younger adults can do with only one side of their brain. And that's evidence of uh, maybe deteriorating cognitive performance. But if you train them, they can, you know, match if not uh, outperform younger adults. So there's this idea of resilience and neuroplasticity. What it actually does for driving ability, don't know. Um, but there's some interest in this. And it's a very um, kind of a face valid task of you're paying attention to this roadway and you're reacting when something changes in your uh, rear view mirror there. So interesting, yeah, stay tuned. So other practical recommendations um, is that uh, clinicians should reassess driving severity or dementia severity and appropriateness of driving every six months. Uh, we will often ask for those of either, you know, we suspect they're doing okay or did fine on a driving evaluation uh, that someone who knows them well ride with them at least uh, every other week or so, or maybe once a week, once a month, depending on the scenario. Um, and then we'll come back and reassess at the six month mark, not always with another formal rehabilit or driving evaluation, but um, a, a thorough, you know, let's talk about driving conversation. And in a very small study, uh, the majority of individuals uh, failed that second test at six months. So, you know, again, this is a progressive disease. We are going to get to the point where you need to retire from driving, highly likely at least, the, the vast majority of individuals. Um, so continuing that conversation around the plan to retire from driving and how you're going to get your community mobility needs met. So now what? You've done the evaluation, you've got the results, you've got to sit down and talk with the individual. Um, what I have found that works, and there's not a lot of you know, evidence-based information about this, so you're getting in the territory of opinion here. Uh, but validating that this is one of the hardest things on top of a very hard thing of a neurodegenerative disease and diagnosis that, yeah, this is hard. So you can validate that, but you're not going to stay talking about how hard it is for very long. You're going to move on. You're going to get into the nuts and bolts of here's what we need to do. You know, we need to accept the fact that this is going on and we need to figure out what our next steps are. Uh, some people respond well to the reminder that this is a privilege and not a right. Um, I'd be really careful with that one. You have to know your person pretty well before you pull that card out. Uh, maybe a timing issue for that one too. Um, but that, you know, being clear that your recommendations are not all or nothing, they're not black and white, that, you know, restrictions don't mean completely stopping driving. So if we hit a gray area somewhere where we can agree that you're not going to drive in these scenarios based off the evaluation and guidance, you know, that doesn't necessarily lead to the next step is you are uh, going to need to um, retire in three months or six months or even a year. We'll keep an eye on this and that you are partnering with them and that the behavioral interventions of disabling the car or changing the keys or selling the car are really a last resort um, that you really don't want to get there for that, nor do you want to get to the place where you are contacting the DMV to have their license rescinded. Uh, and certainly uh, people are varyingly open to consultation with another provider. Um, I've heard more than once, well, wait a minute, you want me to go and do this driving evaluation? Why would I do that when all this person's going to do is tell me I can't drive? Why would I spend 400 bucks to have somebody tell me that you're telling me that right now, more or less for you know, insurance to pay for it. So it's, you know, that's worth a conversation too. Um, you can certainly educate um, patients and families uh, with the literature that's out there. You can indeed uh, educate them around the legal and financial risks. Um, I 
would say based on experience that uh, the only thing that I have seen offset um, possible liability due to cognitive impairments uh, when medical records have been requested by an attorney after a questionable fault accident has been a driving evaluation that says, yes, this person has Alzheimer's disease, they have impaired short-term memory and language, but their driving abilities are fine for right now. Uh, this was an individual who had that done, got into an accident two and a half months later, uh, after all the legal process, so, well, yeah, there is evidence in the medical record of cognitive impairment, but there's also evidence that would say that does not pertain to driving issues or it doesn't impact driving. Uh, you can also um, sometimes recruit someone's desire to preserve their legacy. You know, you hear the story of, I've been driving for 45 years and I've never been in one accident. Great, let's keep it like that. Let's go out on top and preserve that legacy. How fantastic would it be to be able to say you were never in an accident, um, you know, and that the risks are, you know, well, I don't care if I got hurt, maybe, but you know, the risks are to somebody else. And sometimes you can get some buy-in with that, uh, or at least you can plant those seeds. Uh, I would also encourage you to be aware of your own feelings, thoughts, and biases around this, um, uh, particularly when you encounter what can be perceived as resistance. Um, you know, do you double down and say, that's it, fine, we don't have to have this conversation, I'm going to call the DMV, I don't care what you say, what you're going to do, uh, or is it a, okay, I need to think about another way to approach this, maybe at the next visit or maybe in a month while we continue to mitigate our risks. Uh, and then keeping on top of what the resources are, it, it's, man, to tell someone they can't drive and then have nothing to hand them in terms of, but here's what we can do. You know, here's the you know resource for these, you know, access or um, other, uh, like the, the American Parkinson's Disease Association has a taxi cab voucher program, or at least had, I don't know if they still do, uh, to get people with Parkinson's to their medical appointments. So there are things that are out there. So to be able to hand that in place. Uh, the advice for families, um, boy, you know, simple stuff like maybe don't hang the car keys right by the door. Uh, maybe when the kids are over, uh, maybe they don't talk about the road trip they took or going for a drive to Montana or wherever they're going. Uh, you know, confronting somebody about, well, remember, you know, Dr. So-and-so said you couldn't, eh, that doesn't really work too well. Um, and, uh, to have tools for families to be able to redirect and not get into an argument around what provider said what and well I can still do this and you no know, you know just to be able again validate that difficulty and yeah it must be so hard not to be able to do that based on what you know Dr. X, Y, and Z said hey let's you know that jigsaw puzzle we haven't finished that sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't but. so let's talk a little bit about resources looks like we're at 507 um, one is uh, through our Department of Licensing. There are usually some safe driving for seniors uh, courses. And the nice thing about those is that if you do them, they're about eight hours. Uh, you get a discount on your insurance often. Uh, they are offered online. So it's not something that uh, has been uh, put on hiatus because of COVID. Uh, you can also request reevaluation. Uh, through the Department of Licensing, or you can report unsafe drivers and um, you know, there is a provider mechanism to have someone's license uh, rescinded. Uh, what I can tell you here in Washington is that physician medical reporting is permitted. Uh, we are not a mandatory reporter state. Uh, you have no immunity and it is not confidential. So if you as a provider uh, report to the DMV that you have concerns about one of your patients, they contact the patient and say, we want you to submit to a repeat evaluation. Uh, patient says, who turned me in? And they would tell them it was your doctor. And if they then decided they wanted to see you for that, there's no state level protection because you acted in good faith, then oh, you know, we, we trust that you did the right thing. Uh, so that's something you have to know. Uh, the other thing to know is that anybody in the state of Washington can submit this form. It's not just a provider, healthcare provider. Uh, so it could be a family member, it could be a neighbor. Um, and sometimes you can find um, somebody in the family who's willing to submit it. Uh, I don't get the sense it could be, but I don't get the sense that they're treated differentially in terms of weight that, oh, if a provider submitted this, then we really need to get this person in. Pretty much everybody goes through the same process. Uh, here is the form. Uh, it's one page. 
it's very simple. Um, you can see here who, who it is that's uh, um, checking the boxes to submit this. Uh, I took a look a couple of days ago at some of the other states. I'm sorry if anybody is in Oregon, um, I ran out of time. But in our whammy region, um, Alaska has some interesting things in that uh, they will try to keep it confidential if the person uh, asks who turned me in. Uh, but if there's some kind of a legal hearing, then it's probably going to come out, uh, but it won't just be divulged right away. Idaho, there's no specific form. Um, and there seem to be some really confusing changes around their policies. Uh, historically, it looked like uh, age 62, every um, license expired and then had to get renewed in every four years instead of seven. But now it looks like you can do it online and it might be up to age 75. I, the DMV sites are harder to navigate than our Harborview sites, uh, which are awful. Uh, Montana, uh, it looks like all licenses expire at age 75, then you renew every four years. Uh, there is a statute uh, that grants physicians uh, immunity for liability if it's done in good faith. Uh, and same thing that in Wyoming, uh, providers are immune from liability if again, done in good faith. So interesting differences, check your state. It's usually the DMV. Um, they are, were also historically compiled in the American Geriatric uh, Society series or a book around assessing and counseling older drivers. This is a great resource, but it's also 300 pages. Um, there's an old version, I think uh, the second edition that had a state by state. Here's the requirements by, I think they scrapped that because it's probably hard to keep that up to date. And I would wonder about liability in terms of providing advice about state by state things if you're not keeping it up to date. Uh, but what's nice about this is there's some very practical uh, clinical interventions. It covers some of the legal and ethical issues, general review of state licensing reporting laws, uh, and then lots of tools, um, including the MOCA, uh, the trails, the trail making tests. Um, it's, a, it's a great, and it's free. You just have to create an account and you can download it. So highly recommend that just as a resource to have. Uh, you can point your patients and families to the senior driving site uh, for AAA, which will link them up with um, both licensing laws as well as um, maybe some things to optimize fit. Uh, simple stuff, not rocket science. AAA also offered this online tool that measured visual spatial function and executive function to a degree. Uh, and would um, spit out a kind of an overview of your risk. I couldn't get this to work, so I don't know if this is still happening, um, but um, it used to come on a CD and some occupational therapists would include it as part of their uh, assessment in conjunction with other things like useful field of view. So it's, uh, maybe you can get it to work, I don't know. Uh, the Hartford Group has wonderful resources around uh, family conversations with older drivers, um, especially those with dementia, even just older drivers in general. Uh, they get into things like medications and uh, maybe physical conditions uh, that would also impact driving, not just dementia and cognition. And then your local community resources, which are going to vary wildly across states uh, and counties within states, uh, even cities within counties, uh, access um, here in Washington, our community living connections, um, senior information assistance, uh, VA benefits, there may be some excellent things there. And of course, you know, what's available for local organizations and societies, highly contingent on funding and uh, changing frequently. Uh, this is the way our our AAAs are organized here in Washington. Uh, and I can tell you that you don't have to go too far out of King County for the things that are available, like basically over Snoqualmie Pass, all of a sudden you, you don't qualify. Um, and community uh, Living Connections is another uh, kind of a similar uh, structured organization. Uh, and there are some transportation specific things there per county, uh, not just by region. So, you know, in the name of time, um, maybe, maybe we'll open it up to questions. I, we, can, we can talk about the case um, if you like, but I'm also, um, I've been talking at you a lot and maybe it's more value added to move on to questions and answers. Uh, we can come back to it if we have time. How about that? There's an executive decision. Sounds good. 
Um, we have a question from Mary Zeitner. She said she had a special situation. One aspect of her work is concussion evaluation among older racers. And many or most probably have a history of unrecognized TBI, but not yet to CTE. Any special considerations for this group, either return to play or loss of race license, observation on the track, comments from other racers? And race, I'm thinking uh, this is car like uh, car racing. Yeah. yeah. So very interesting. So one of the other things that I get to do, my other area of expertise is uh, sport concussion. And um, I work with my professional sports teams around return to play and assessing that. Really relatively straightforward with professional athletes and kids uh, with older adults. So a couple things there. One is, um, boy, it is hard to go back and retrospectively assess concussions in terms of how many, the time period in between concussions, recovery curves. Uh, what I would say with the older folks um, is that recovery takes longer, is less linear. Uh, it takes even longer if there's a history of concussions before that. Uh, the relationship between concussion and neurodegeneration, whether CTE or raising risk for Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's is unclear, but becoming clear um, and certainly seems to be there. So you have a population that has risk on a couple of different levels. And I think that um, uh, that window for recovery and return to activity is a little longer than it would be for younger folks. And you'd have to get a better sense of, you know, again, prior concussion history, uh, what's the likelihood of something minimally emerging that's neurodegenerative, kind of been percolating under the surface and now has been unmasked by a concussion. Um, so sometimes people don't get back to baseline. That's a that's a complicated one worth like an hour and a half in, in and of itself. But those are the things I'd be thinking about as I assess that. So Mary is saying that current evaluation is track side after an incident. Uh -huh. Oh boy. Yeah. You know, that, oh boy, that I can't fully speak to because the way things have changed in, you know, sport concussion is um, there's a, at least for, for a suspected concussion, I mean, you're, you're kind of, you're not going back to play right away, right? The, you could have a head injury, but um, I would want to know what they're doing trackside. Is it a scat five? Is it, you know, vestibular testing? Yeah, complicated. I'm happy to follow up on that. Uh, afterwards, you'll have my contact info uh, via the slides, but send send me a message. That's a that's an interesting one. Um, so Chris is wondering uh, the office assessment that you covered is is that available as a tool somewhere other than in the slides? The uh, the um, kind of the history. Um, yeah. That you know, I I put that together. That's what I do. So um, that's just based on the things that I have found to be important and uh, value added in terms of assessing driving history. Okay. And Rose is asking: Are there conversations making the mocha transliterated so that it makes sense to people of other cultures? Yeah, boy. Um, so the mocha has you know, been validated, or not validated? It's been. Um, uh, translated into, I think, 18 or 19 languages at this point. Uh, but the construct of cognitive assessment and some of the things that you're assessing in the MOCA make absolutely no sense. Um, so for, especially for folks who have few years of education or no formal education, um, and there's a really nice screening instrument, the, the RUDAS, the Roland uh, Universal Dementia Screening, I think, um, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, that I tend to use for folks who are non-English speaking with low years of education and for whom the things you're asking them to do in the MOCA just don't make sense. So uh, I'm a big fan of the right tool for the right person. And um, for, for some folks, you know, like um, we see here at Harborview, we see a lot of non-English speaking folks. And for our, you know, well-educated Vietnamese, uh, Russian, um, Korean folks, the MOCA does pretty well. There's also a, a, the MOCA blind, which is meant to be administered to individuals with visual impairment that you can do over the phone or over telemedicine uh, that seems to get away from some of those items that can be confusing. Okay. So a couple of, couple of options there. Can you suggest tests for right frontal lobe stroke? I know you went over it, but um, was wondering if you could suggest that again. 
Yeah, boy, that's um, one of my favorite advisors told me it takes frontal lobes to evaluate frontal lobes. <laughs> um, so for right frontal or, you know, dorsolateral kind of prefrontal things, um, not knowing is this, you know, is this the orbital frontal, superior frontal, but, um, you know, the stroop is a pretty good measure, uh, easily administered. Um, uh, I, I tend to like the, you know, the tower test, uh, the Tower of London, um, like card sorting tests, like the Wisconsin card sorting test. These are all good. Um, matrix reasoning. So there's some nonverbal reasoning kind of tasks tend to be good for that. Great. Yeah. I don't have other questions at the moment, so I don't know if people are getting them ready or if you want to tap into the case study a little bit. Well, let's let's do that. We can always come back to questions if there are any burning ones. I, I may have successfully bludgeoned people with information, but um, I think they're it's, it's, really appreciating all of the guidance and resources. Oh uh, well, I'd I'd like to think so. Thanks. Um, so let's let's go through this. It it is kind of interesting. So we've already talked about the history. Just a reminder, kind of two year history, gradual insidious onset, um, no hallucinations, fluctuations. So that should be important to you as you think about Louis body. Like okay, maybe that maybe not. We're there. Um, medical history. We talked about that. Uh, so when she comes into the evaluation, uh, she is emotionally labile. Uh, she is tangential and digressive. So you ask her one question, but you end up hearing about a number of other things that ultimately do not conclude back to the question. Uh, and when you redirect her back to the question at hand, she's irritated and clear about that. Uh, she is perseverative on the accident. She's worried about what this is going to mean for her driving um, privileges. Uh, and it's a little hard to tell whether she's fidgety versus just anxious. And you know, most people, when they come in for detailed cognitive assessment are pretty anxious and stressed out. So here are her results. Uh, her MOCA is a 27. Um, she's got uh, negative three on recall, but she does pretty well with the cues. So it's more of a retrieval problem than it is a storage problem. Uh, her pre-morbid abilities, so vocabulary and irregular word reading are good indices of kind of crystallized intelligence and overall intelligence. Uh, she's brighter than average, which fits with her educational and occupational history. Why that becomes important is you can also look at the data relative to her abilities, not just people like her. So for somebody who is of superior intelligence, a score in the low average range, even though that's okay relative to somebody their age, is a little, if not significantly too low. Uh, so she's got problems with verbal memory, but their scores are in the low average range for most things. Uh, severely impaired though, when you make the information more complex. Uh, visual memory, uh, she's got high average immediate memory, but then low average uh, recall and low average recognition. So maybe a little storage problem there. And then when you make the information more complex, it becomes more impaired. Uh, her visual spatial skills are impaired for the block design. Uh, okay for a copying task, um, not great for judging kind of orientations of lines or putting information together visually. Uh, her language abilities are eh, variable, um, but with uh, low average semantic verbal fluency, low average naming, um, and then executive functioning, uh, her Stroop uh, interference task is borderline impaired. Uh, Trails B is low average, right on the cusp of borderline impaired with two set loss errors. Um, and her tower, which again is a nice measure of planning, problem solving, uh, inhibition. Um, she's got five rule violations. Um, her ray figure, which you saw earlier, uh, spatially looks good, but is really poorly organized. And her uh, abstraction concept formation, uh, learning from experience is borderline impaired. Um, she's having a hard time learning. She's not depressed, she's not anxious. Um, so what's her diagnosis? And is she safe to drive? Um, so this, again, if this were a live presentation, we would uh, have a conversation about this. Ultimately, after she, I, I thought, looking at this, based on the history, the onset, the progression of symptoms, the constellation of the neurocognitive results, uh, that uh, there was enough in there that looked an awful lot like Alzheimer's disease, but a more frontal variant Alzheimer's disease with a heavier executive or disexecutive syndrome on top of the memory, which is a little bit more amnestic, uh, a little bit more of a storage, maybe a encoding slash storage deficit. Uh, and then with some patterns of language that look an awful lot like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
and in the early stages, uh, the fact that she had an accident and, you know, as you talk with her more that, yeah, you know, I've been having trouble managing my medications. Um, no alcohol use, wonderful question. Um, uh, and no history, at least that she was willing to, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, that's right, she had two servings. Um, so could be, could be, could be, could be. And um, what happens if you get somebody to cut down or stop altogether? Um, uh, good question. So that could be adding the little frontal flavor to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, very true. Uh, but the question of, is she safe to drive? So she's somewhere in the cusp between late MCI and early stage dementia. She went on to have a PET scan and the she's got changes in the precuneus, even though there's no atrophy. She's got changes in the medial temporal lobe and some hypometabolism metabolism in the frontal lobe. So they thought Alzheimer's disease also, no vascular. So the neuropsych and the functional brain imaging kind of line up. Uh, is she safe to drive? And uh, we know that she's already had an accident. We know that she's got impaired and becoming more impaired executive functioning. And we know she's got impairments in visual spatial skills, visual memory, verbal memory, I'm less worried about, language I'm less worried about. And I would agree with Caroline that she is not safe to drive. Um, and even if she was at this point in time, we are rapidly approaching the point where she is not going to be driving. Uh, the only caveat here would be back to the alcohols. Thank you for reminding that is that if this was largely driven by alcohol and you can get someone to reduce or eliminate their use and there are improvements that might be worth reassessing. This isn't just a pattern of alcohol though. The language changes, the visual spatial changes, the memory. Um, so there's, there's more here than just that. It might be adding gasoline to the campfire, but there's more than just that. So my determination was that this is somebody who, even despite their high MOCA score, is unlikely to pass a driving evaluation, but I did recommend it because she wasn't going to stop uh, without a specialist in that assessing actual driving ability. Um, and uh, she did not pass the driving evaluation. Wow. So, and I, she unfortunately has been lost to follow up at this point. So I think that also is, you know, the risk of this. So I don't know. Um, I, I wish I had an update for you, but that's kind of part of the difficulty of the work. Um, so there's my contact info. Uh, um, one more question. Oh, good. Yep. So Claire is asking about visual spatial um, and interaction with memory tasks. She had a patient who could drive but not find his car. Hmm. Okay. Or her car. Interesting. Um, and couldn't find the car, maybe just because couldn't remember where they parked it. Don't know. You know, I, I think about when people have trouble finding their car, sometimes it's a, I parked it somewhere and I, I, I can't remember where it is. And I, I get confused in buildings and I come out the wrong exit and then I get overwhelmed and stressed. Um, you know, and that to me, if that's a kind of a memory related thing uh, versus I'm looking for my car uh, oh, tried to get into another car. Interesting. Uh, but could navigate okay and could, you know, recognize street signs and landmarks and... Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so for me, again, the, the memory piece is, is a little bit less concerning, especially if they have somebody with them who is helping navigate um, and prompt them of, you know, hey, this turn's coming up in about five minutes. And you know, that that to me, but the, the visual spatial can't judge distances, can't recognize environments, can't see pedestrians or other things as they're moving, uh, or the executive part of, or, and attention. I, I can't pay attention, I can't make sense of stuff, and then I'm impulsive. That's like the worst combination. Memory's not great, but less, less, less worrisome. Interesting. Well, I think um, we've got, uh, we don't have any other, oh, can I ask what the relationship is between ADHD and dementia you mentioned at the beginning of the talk? No clue. Um, I, I would say that, oh, I mentioned earlier that uh, in FTD, there's uh, increased crash risk because of speeding and inattention and poor judgment. And those kind of accidents look a lot like ADHD and older teens and younger adults. Uh, but in terms of ADHD, increasing risk for dementia, no idea. Okay. Well, this has been great. Um, it's always a, a very popular lecture and one that's highly valued. And the topic has come up in about four of our other lectures this series. So oh, it's hard. 
Yeah, it's certainly a dilemma. Thanks so much, Dr. Rhodes. Really, really appreciate it. And I'll see all of you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks. My pleasure.